So we're, we are wending our way through the book of Joshua. And uh, I'm thinking probably 12, maybe 13 lessons, because there's what, around 25 chapters or something. And um, so right now, last week, where did we end? I mean, they hadn't yet crossed into the promised land, but they're getting ready to. So God told Joshua to be faithful. We know Joshua is now the leader. The, uh, the mantle of authority and leadership passed on from Moses to Joshua. And so he spoke to, um, spoke to his people as well as three tribes who will basically hang out on the other side of the Jordan once they cross over. And uh, so now they're getting ready. So they will cross over today. Now they're not going to we're not going to come, you know, it's, we're not going to have the fun with the Battle of Jericho yet, if we want to call that fun, but we'll get to that, okay? So we now find ourselves ready to cross into chapter 3, just like the Israelites are ready to cross into the promised land. So let us, let us listen to the first few verses. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Shittim. And they came to the Jordan, he and all the people of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. At the end of three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, As soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Okay, so if you were here 15 years ago, <laughs> whenever we went through the book of Exodus, or if you just remember the book of Exodus or um, other parts of the Torah, what is the Ark of the Covenant? We know an Ark is a box, right? Okay. Yeah, Ten Commandments. So yeah, inside it did contain several things. Ten Commandments. Uh, if you remember the kind of the rebellion that the Israelites had, it said, what's the deal with the political priest? Why, everybody could be a priest. What's the stink, right? So, um, so you know, there was a showdown, and Aaron um, put his, his walking stick down and said, well, if it buds, then, you know, God is with me, and if it doesn't, then he's not with you. Or if it doesn't, he's with you. And it, it buds, and all the rebellious people die, and that ends up going in the Ark of the Covenant as well as what? Like a container of manna. So in the Ark of the Covenant, it contained those things which were all what? Things the people groused and complained about and in a sense it, it highlighted their sin, which was perfect because once a year, the priest would go into what was called the most holy place or the holy of holies and would what? He would pour the blood of the sacrificed animal atop the Ark so there were two figures of angels, um, and then there was also kind of an area, it was called the mercy seat. And of course, the blood would then be poured on that. So that's, here we have a picture of blood covering the people's sin. Well, that's perfect because that's going to point forward to somebody else actually doing that, right? And that'll point forward to Jesus. So, so yeah, so it's, it's the place where God promised to be, right? But it's also a symbol of God's presence because he said, this is where I will be. So whenever, but the ark itself was not the presence of God. Okay. So they're going to follow it. So, in a, so what's the implication if they're going to follow the ark of the covenant? Well, they're following God. This is, this is the way God wants us to go. So as the expression is go with God, yeah, okay. So that makes perfect sense, this kind of setup. If we don't know the whole Ark of the Covenant, we just go, oh, okay, and you're not supposed to touch it. So, you know, that's, that's why the priests, I mean, there's this whole deal about how you carry it. You have to get these poles, and oh, it's, yeah. So, anyways. All right, so that's kind of the setup. He's telling them, this is how we're going to proceed, okay? Except there's a problem. Based on the time of year, they're crossing the Jordan, but it's also the time with the heavy spring rains. And you, so it's not just kind of 
It's not like the Mississippi, you know, after a drought and you look and you can't even move barges on the river. It's Mississippi in 1993, or maybe not that bad. Um, so, but yeah, so the, the, mo the current is fast, the water level is high, so it's a big deal to try to cross the Jordan when it's, when it's full of water and the, and the current is heavy, okay? But that's the situation, okay? So if they're going to follow, like, well, I hope we all don't trip and fall, especially if the Ark of the Covenant, right? That would be a disaster because that's, that's holy because that's where God said he will be present for his people. So let's continue on. Oh, it says here I'm supposed to read verses one through six, but I just read verses one through four. It should be five and six. Homemade lessons when I'm cooking chili. Not a good thing. Okay, verses five and six. I think I just skipped something, did I not? Yeah, verse four. <laughs> yeah. There shall be a distance between you and it about 2,000 cubits in length. So that's a good distance, okay? Uh, do not come near it in order that you may know the way you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. Okay, so there's going to be enough distance, but they can still see the ark, but part of it is it's a, it's a, it's a holy piece of architecture, okay? So don't touch it, etc. cetera, but, he, but Joshua explains why, right? Then Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. So consecrate yourselves and he says, why? For the Lord will do wonders, right, before you. And Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. So it's almost like a, like a preview, right? The people see the Ark of the Covenant and then they go, oh, okay. Now, why would that be a big deal? Because normally, where would the Ark of the Covenant be if they weren't moving? Yeah, people didn't see it. I mean, it, was, it just wasn't in, in the tent. It, there was a tent, and then there was a tent over the tent, and then there was a courtyard. Yeah, it's a good... So at least they'll know what it looks like because some people may have not. They go, well, I've heard there was something special in there, but, right? So, so the people will know what it looks like because Joshua says, go on front of the people because normally it's cloistered in the Holy of Holies, okay? So he tells the people to consecrate themselves, which is like sanctify yourself, except in a sense we can't truly sanctify ourselves, though we are involved in it. But all this is part of what? I mean, the, the process is what? Setting ourselves apart for something holy. Okay, that's what the whole Sabbath day is about, right? Remember the Sabbath day if you wanna, let's, let's, let's revise the translation. Remember the Sabbath day to holy it, right? Um, so, so, you know, based on the Exodus text, if we remember it, then what? That's how we holy it, okay? So all of this is stuff, yeah, they're involved, but it's really to set themselves apart because something holy is going to take place. God's going to do something. The thing is, the people don't know what, okay? So, they're, they're, so this is all kind of preparation, right? And that's not weird as long as it doesn't end up becoming the main event, right? I mean, I think some of us could remember in times past when there was sort of preparation to receive the supper, right? So as long as it doesn't take over and become the main event. I mean, the supper is the main event. So any preparations that we would do would be purely in recognition of that, right? Um, so, and that's what the small catechism says. Oh yeah, fasting is certainly good. But he says, don't lose focus on what the supper is really for. Okay. So, now they're going to cross. Let's see what happens. Did you guys cheat and read ahead? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh well, that's a spoiler. <laughs> so, a spoiler alert here. Okay. So, 
We're going to look at uh, verses 7 through 17. That's the rest of the chapter, so we'll get the whole lay of the land. And then we'll explore subparts within that, okay? Um, the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. We don't know the context of this. Okay, maybe God is just deciding to do this. Maybe there was some grousing among the people. But the text doesn't tell us, right? And as for you, command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant. When you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. And Joshua said to the people of Israel, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, here is how you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites. We all know about the Hivites. They're, they were some bad folks. I just said that. The Perizzites, the Girgish, it's the Girgashites we have to worry about. The Amorites and the Jebusites, really the Amorites I think were, were worse. Behold, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is passing over before you into the Jordan. Now, therefore, take the tw twelve men from the tribes of Israel, from each tribe a man. And when the soles of the feet of the priests bearing the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan shall be cut from flowing, cut off from flowing, and the waters coming down from above shall stand in one heap. Does that sound familiar in any way? Did something like that happen earlier in Israel's history? Perhaps in a more dramatic and larger way. Yeah, the crossing of the Red Sea. Right? Yeah. So, when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as soon as those bearing the Ark had come as far as the Jordan, and the feet of the priests bearing the Ark were dipped into the brink of the water, now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest. Now the text tells us this. This is a big deal because this is during what? Yeah, yeah. Which, you know, is a, you know, now we try to manage all that, right? With dams and everything else. We still have floods, but not like in the old days without all that stuff. But I mean, in a sense, those things are necessary to make the land fertile, right? Yeah. Uh, the waters coming down from above stood and rose in a heap very far away, right? At Adam, the city that is beside Zarathan, and those flowing down toward the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea, were completely cut off. And the people passed over opposite Jericho. Now the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all Israel was passing over on dry ground, until all the nations finished passing over the Jordan. Okay, so what do we have a picture of? The priests are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, right? So they're having the poles. And and soon as like one of the toes of the leading priest touches the water, right? And then they kind of, and then they stop. And so the people really go around them. But so, so now there's, they, you know, they're walking as if it's the water, it's as if it's flowing, but then it doesn't, it, then it stops. And so it's as if the water is just kind of like being held back by a giant invisible dam, right? So I would imagine that maybe it would get, be a little scary if you're crossing, because you can, it's not just, oh, it dried up, and, but you can see the water, and you're like, whoa. So that would be, I think, a bit frightening, because you're like, well, I hope God doesn't blink because we're in trouble. So, yeah. Okay. So, and that's so, uh, the water shall stand. Ahmad paints the image of water hitting an invisible wall and stopping abruptly. So that's what we will find. Boop. So, um, crossing the Jordan during the flood season, was this just like coincidental? No, it's a miracle and that's made known because it doesn't start to happen until the priests enter the water, carrying the Ark of the Covenant, which is the place where God promised to be with his old covenant people. And now the people can pass through, right? During uh, 
during the during flood stage across the Jordan River. Okay. Well, let's see a couple, couple. So why did God choose this moment to lift Joshua? Remember, he said he was going to raise Joshua. The text could imply that maybe he's not Moses, though the people groused about Moses all the time, right? But yeah, so nobody's ever happy with, I mean, is everybody, is everybody happy with President Biden? <laughs> no, I mean, I'm just, let alone how, he, how he's president. The man has Alzheimer's. So, you know, right there, it's like, you know, your wife should tell you, thank you, thank you, honey, but your time is over. Let's go to an Alzheimer's section and whatever. But hey, so it's not weird that people may not like someone's leadership. So, which makes me think that there's going to, even though God said the land is yours, there's going to be some rough times ahead where they will need good leadership. And so if the people are not following the leader, things don't go well, okay? So that makes sense. So this is kind of, this is the text kind of saying that it's letting us know that there's a possibility of kind of a fracas ahead and the leadership will be needed, okay? All right, let's look at the next question. How does Joshua's leadership shine during the river crossing? Well, he's following God. God's the main event, right? But he's doing everything as he should. So in that sense, he's standing as a good leadership figure, right? Um, and in this particular case, the leader does what God says. These are God's old covenant people, okay? So it's not like our government today, okay? So, all right. Um, what parting does the river Jordan hold? Well, it, it's, it's like crossing the Red Sea, but the thing is, that happened, you know, their parents would have told them about that, but they didn't experience it themselves because they wandered through the desert for 40 years because when they went up to the Jordan before, those guys are giants, they'll, ki they'll, they'll kick our butts, we'll get defeated, we can't go, we can't do this. Okay, I'll wait for another generation. And so there it was, right? We're tired of eating this. Okay, I'll give you some quail in the evening. So, and then, so this, people didn't know about the Red Sea except what their parents had told them. So there we have it. And so now in a sense, they're kind of revisiting that, reliving it in a different way and it's, being, it's made anew. Like, wow, Grandpa wasn't just blowing hot air. It was real. So, okay. Um, oh, what does this miracle reflect about? Ah, I come up with a lot of crazy questions when I'm making chili. I need to make more chili. So what does this miracle reflect about God's power and faithfulness? Well, that he's faithful, that he, that he will be true to his promises. So, when God says the land is already yours, okay, it's ours, but it's ours in God's way, not our way. That's the big problem, isn't it? Because we know how people are. We wanna do everything our way. And that, that's always the rub. Even today, right? Well, I know God says, but times are different or whatever it may be right so nothing is new we still have the same sinful nature it's just you know in a sense what they do is lived out more publicly so we'll get to see that this dynamic as we continue to go through the book of joshua right okay well the priests are standing in the water and there's this giant wall and it's kind of scary, but they cross on dry land. Let's see what happens. Do they all get swept away? I hope not. Did you guys cheat? Read ahead. Chapter four. Okay. When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, 
Take 12 men from the people of each. Okay, so it's what? It's kind of repeating the, really what he said before, but now it's going to happen. Okay? Take 12 men from the people, one from each tribe, and command them, saying, Take 12 stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you, and lay them, lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. Aha, uh -huh. okay. So, um, then Joshua called the 12 men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe. And Joshua said, you notice a little bit of the repetition? It's not just, uh, well, you know, he's just being repetitive. It, this is highlighting the importance of it. So it's being reset, And then it's being reset, maybe slightly differently. Okay. Very common kind of rhetorical tool in Hebrew. Okay, so, okay, it's being repeated a number of times, so let's take note. And Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder. So what does that tell you about the size of the stone now, which wasn't said earlier? See, go get a stone, but now put it upon your shoulder. In other words, get a big stone not a pebble, right? So, 12 big stones, okay. according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off from the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord when it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So the stone shall be the people, shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. And the people of Israel did just as Joshua commanded and took up the twelve stones out of the midst of the Jordan according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, just as the Lord told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to the place where they lodged and laid them there. And Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan in a place where the feet of the priest bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are there to this day. Well, to the day that, right, the book of Joshua was written. Probably not there now, but who knows? Because I would have thought, these are the stones. So I would think it would kind of be a big deal. But still, 12 big stones. What's the purpose? Why? Yeah. What are these stones here for, Dad? Oh, well, let me tell you, right? So this kind of lets us know what has God used in our everyday lives for His purposes? He's taking everyday stones and saying, assemble them. So when kids in their national curiosity, well, this is weird. There's a pile of stones here. It just didn't happen on its own. Why are they here, Dad? Oh, well, let me tell you, son. And then, you know, the dad recounts the story of how God brought the people across the river during flood stage. See? So it becomes a vehicle to what? tell the story of God working with his people. Do we do anything like that today? What's in front of the sanctuary? Why? Well, yeah, I suppose if somebody has no clue at all, which is becoming more and more the case, right? So, what are those two pieces of wood up there for? Well, let me tell you, right? You, I mean, you know, there's a whole lot to tell. Because in that, what? Is our sinfulness, but God's cure for our sinfulness, what it took, all of that is in that if we know the story. So, what about today? Hanging of the greens. Each one of these things tells a story. And the story ultimately goes back to Christ. 
I mean, if it doesn't, why are we telling this story? Right? Even if it's, even if it may not directly go, it still needs to, right? Like, what about a saint day in the church year calendar? Sure, we're remembering uh, some special guy. Why? Not because he was some big deal in and of himself, but we, as Scripture says, what? We know those who came before us that we may follow their example. That's in Scripture. Okay? Why? Because we see this person and go, ah, how did his life, how did his, his words point to Christ? That's the reason why. And if it's not, get rid of them. They serve no purpose. Right? So, yeah. But so these memorial things, that's not weird. The whole church calendar, in a sense, is that. Advent, oh, we're preparing for Christ's birth. Christmas, oh, Christ is born. Epiphany, oh, the wise men, the Gentiles come to see the Messiah. The story of salvation is also for them. And then so on and so forth, right? You know, so, I mean, all of these, the church calendar in many ways is a memorial. So when you kind of look at this stuff, you go, well, why do we have to do that? We don't have to. But when you look at the whole amount of Scripture and all the things in it, you go, but it would make, if we weren't, it would make sense to make one, right? So um, we just want to make sure that it's, it would serve its purpose to, to mark the events of Christ. So we learn who our God is and also of our salvation. Okay. Are we good? Yeah, okay. Jim says we're good, so we're good. All right. So there you have it, okay? Well, the thing is, all of that happened and we now understand about memorials and the stones and that they served a purpose. But who's still in the middle of the river? The priest. It's getting kind of scary here, Joshua. Uh, can we leave now? Because, uh, I mean, you know, I know God's doing his thing, but is he going to stop all the water in the world? Right? So, because it said it just, it didn't stop the flow, right? So the longer this went on, the more the miracle became obvious. And so at some point, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> so, I mean, I, you know, if we were actually living that, it would, yeah, yeah. It would be an amazing, but also, I would probably say fearful event too because we're experiencing something that was not normal and that God normally didn't do, right? I mean, if they just decided, oh, it's flooding, well, God will part the waters. He will? Did he say that he would do that to you, right? So this is God choosing to do this, okay? All right. Verses 15 through 18. Okay. Well, I have to... Okay. Ah, these, I'll tell you. So I don't think I read all the way to 14, did I? No, where did I stop? Probably like verse 10, so 11. The people passed over in haste, and when all the people had finished passing over, the Ark of the Covenant and the priests passed over before the people... Then the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad, remember those guys? They're like, yeah, they're going to hang out on the other side of the Jordan. So what's going on with these kind, of, these kind of two and a half tribes, right? And the half tribe of Manasseh passed over armed for the people of Israel as Moses had told them. So they passed over, but eventually they're going to cross back over and kind of hang out there. Okay? Um, about 40,000 ready for war passed over before the Lord for battle to the plains of Jericho. Isn't the land already theirs? Why would you need 40,000? Right? Well, now it makes sense, right? What was perhaps implied? Oh, we need a good leader. So 
the Lord had lifted up Joshua in his leadership and now 40,000, oh, wow. The land may be theirs, but I'll tell you, there'll be a lot of people there who won't recognize that, right? And that's not weird. Well, you're living in northern Gaza. Go south because it's going to get really nasty. This is where I live. I don't want to move. Move or you might get killed, right? The story of the human race. Just like, right? Nothing new under the sun. Okay. We continue on. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they stood in awe of him just as they had stood in awe of Moses all the days of his life. A little hyperbolic there, right? What's the point being made? Because you go, well, all of the people did not always stand in awe of Moses all the time. Is the text lying? No, it's just, it's using what? It's doing this comparison thing because now, how is it, right? So, think about this in the news media, which is often the case, but not always. There might be some guy who's a political leader of some type and you know, he's picked on, made fun of, but when he dies, oh, what a good guy he was. He was the best, right? Most of the times, the best pastor in the congregation is the one who left and who's no longer there. But our current one, ah, oh, that dude's a loser, I'll tell you, right? But soon as the loser leaves, wow, he was so good. So, right? So probably most of the political leadership, except for President Trump for some reason, will, um, you know, when somebody dies, wow, what a great guy. So it's that kind of effect, see, with Moses. So now Joshua is the, he's the current leader, okay? So the idea is that he has a lot of the respect of the people, as if he had died and oh, he was the greatest. So at least for now, he's kind of riding on a high wave, okay? And they will need that leadership and they will need to follow him, okay? Does that make sense? So we have to understand language and its natural use, okay? All right, here we go, 15 through 18. And the Lord said to Joshua, command the priests bearing the Ark of the Testimony to come up out of the Jordan. They're still standing there. So Joshua commanded the priests, come up out of the Jordan. Thank you, Joshua. And when the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came up from the midst of the Jordan and the soles of the priests' feet were lifted up on dry ground, but I thought where they were standing was dry ground. Right? Meaning, they're no longer where the river flowed. Okay, that's, again, language, natural use of language. Okay? So, uh, we're lifted up on dry ground. The waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as before. Okay. So, if for some reason somebody thought, you know... I just think it was coincidence that it happened, right? You know, the difference between causation and correlation? Well, people who eat grapes, what's your secret to live 104 years old? I drink a shot of whiskey every day. Correlation or causation? In other words, does the whis did the whiskey cause her to live 104 years old? Or did she live 104 years old, but she happened to drink a shot of whiskey every day? Right? Um, so in case, oh, well, you know, correlation? No, causation. God was doing this in the way that he chose, and in just in case, there it is. They step, on the, they step off out of the riverbed onto the land, and bloop, there it is. See? So now you have that, and you have the 12 stones as a memorial, so this will live long into Israel's kind of memory. Okay. So, Pastor, are you saying then that if you drink a shot of whiskey, you can stand in the Jordan River on dry ground? Sure. Just trying to catch up. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 
but it has to be the right whiskey, you know, in the Jordan. It has to be during springtime in Jordan, right? When the rivers, right? Yeah. So let's see. No, let's let's get wild. Let's have a wild Kentucky bourbon. We'll do that. All right. All right. So there there we have it. Let's see if there's any questions here. These are chili induced questions. So why did the waters return to their place instantly as priests emerged from the water? We talked about that, but it just shows this is God's doing. What does completing the crossing signify for the people? Well, we're now on a, we're on a different stage of our journey. We should have started this 39 years ago, right? Um, yeah. Right. Well, they could wait for it to get regular. <laughs> but now remember what the spies, remember when they went over to the Jordan and they met Rahab? And Rahab really knew a whole lot of stuff. And we, when we looked at her life, she was a prostitute, but she was more. Okay, she was also an entrepreneur. And she knew the goings on of kind of the different things because, well, <laughs> you know, her clientele did more than physical activity with her. Okay, so she was aware of kind of a lot of the stuff. And so, so the Israelites know that the king of Jericho is waiting for them. And the people are scared because they know that God had done, d protected them in ways that, that showed that it, they should have been beaten up and they weren't. Okay, so except they have a very well fortified city. So if you're just thinking in ways of earthly things, pfft, you know, you had these nomads from the desert. There's no way they could defeat us, right? Oh, well, yeah, farther down. So wouldn't that have its way back? Could be, yeah. That would, uh, oh, I, yeah, it'd be... Uh, I mean, because there were accounts of stuff that people had heard and witnessed that made its way there. They go, oh, wow, the God of the Israelites is a bad dude. So, and I'm doing this from the perspective of people often viewed gods as a particular nation's God. And that's what made what Rahab said so special because she said, he's just no regular God of some nation. He is the God. Okay, so, so Rahab understood that. And so here we have a believer in the true God. So, okay, let's press on, shall we? We turn the page, the very last page. Okay. Oh, I, I wrote this little book. See, Chile's great stuff. Right before Remembrance, the crossing of, the crossing of Jordan. The crossing of the Jordan, homemade lessons, man. The crossing of the Jordan resonates with the symbolism of baptism, does it not? As the Israelites pass through the waters into a new land, Christians pass through baptism into a new life. I mean, this is stuff that the church, you know, when the church meditated and studied the scriptures, they go, wow. You know, when they understand the old covenant in light of the new, it opened up this whole vista. Wow, God was like, he was doing all these things. It was like Hansel and Gretel breadcrumbs all through the Old Testament pointing forward. And now we can see. So, and so a lot of this is really kind of a church history thing that the church in her wisdom goes, oh, whoa, look at that, yeah. See, so this kind of, Oh, I'll just say this. When you kind of look at traditions and history and, and um, interpretations in, in the church, th there is no way that anybody can conclude that the early church was Protestant. And what I mean by that is baptism does nothing. The Lord's Supper is nothing except our, our work because God told us to do it, right? And baptism is our thing because God commanded it. So, you know, the, so the Protestant idea is that it, 
the Pro- Protestantism really turned gospel into law. God works through baptism. We turn that into our work. God works through the Lord's Supper. We turn that into our work. When I say we, I'm just speaking Protestants in general, not Lutherans, right? But there is no way that someone would believe that because that was a novel thing. So, you know, to be deep in church history is to be shallow in Protestantism? I don't know how to say that. But you can't go there. So, um, so, so what we, even though what we may hold true and profess in Lutheranism may be an odd animal in today, in, to, um, in America's modern Christianity, it's not odd when you look at the entire history of the church. And the entire history of the church really sides more with us than, right? What's 500 years in church history? There's 2,000 years plus the whole Old Covenant, right? So 500 years, that's just like bloop, right? Luther knew that. So Luther wasn't trying to start anything new. But I guess when you can't kind of get booted out and it's now legal to murder you, well, uh, you know, maybe he wasn't quite as generous after that. Are we ready to press on? Yeah. Okay. 19 through 24. Okay. The people came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, and they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. So they just went from Shittim to Gilgal. So you can see it's not a big deal, right? But there's a river in between. Okay? And those 12 stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. And he said to the people of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Repeat, right? Hey, he just said that. He needed a good editor. This is highlighting the importance of it. Okay? Then you shall let your children know Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. Notice the very subtle changes. This Jordan. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea. Ah, there it is. There it is. What we knew is now stated, just in case, right? So, Scripture doesn't always do this, but often does this for dullards, right? Or slow to believe, slow to believers, okay? Uh, did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty. Notice your children, all the people. Notice that shift. Okay? So this lets us know what is God's game plan? Oh, well, so the children, your children, but ultimately all the people. What does that sound like? Okay, yeah, I mean, but I mean, go back to the promise of Abram, later Abraham, through you all the peoples of the world will be blessed. So this is hailing back also to the promise made to Abraham, okay? So, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. A lot of stuff there, okay? So, chilly question number whatever this is, 12. How does the erecting of stones at Gilgal testify to future generations? Well, it's since it's a hallmark back. This is what God did. But also, this is our God. He is faithful and true. So he will be true to his promises, okay? So that's that's also there. That's there in the cross. Well, God sent His Son Jesus to what? To pay for our sins and then to rise to give us life. So, if He did all that, do you think He won't return on the last day and call forth our bodies from the grave? Of course He will. 
right? So God establishes the pattern. And so, oh yeah, he will. But, but we'll be like the Israelites in the promised land. Yeah, but I know it's ours, but we want to do it our way. Okay. Okay. Next question, chilly question number 13. Why should future generations learn about this event? Because it testifies to God, right? So, if, Dad, what are these giant stones here? Oh, man, let me tell you about your grandpa. He was a strong dude. He walked in the middle of the Jordan, picked up this giant stone and hoisted it on his shoulder and threw it as if it was a pebble. That's not what you're supposed to remember. See? So, you're supposed to remember the right thing, right? What did God do? Okay? All right. Chilly question number, last one. How can the lesson of the memorial stones apply to our lives today? See? So, when we, when things are brought to our mind, right? It's supposed to do what? It doesn't stop there. So, what do these stones mean? If it just stopped there and didn't actually go to what God did, it fails. Because this memorial does not bring to mind what it's supposed to bring to mind. Right? Just like when I use that ludicrous example of the grandpa and whatever. Right? So, do this in memory of me. If it doesn't bring to mind what God does, it fails. The same thing, right? So, oh, we're remembering. So the point of remembering is you remembering? Isn't it kind of backwards? The point of remembering is not remem me remembering that I'm remembering. The point of remembering is remembering what God did. Ah. Oh. See? So again, the whole thing, even from the Old Testament, do this in memory of me. We know that the remembering has to bring us back to what God did. Remembering is not the event itself. Remembering is the way for us to what? Grapple, know, learn again, experience what God does. Okay, so do this in remembrance, do this in memory of me, of me, Jesus, right? Not you remembering, okay? So all of these things, when we say, well, we're going to do this, we're going to do these stones, and the equivalent of the stones are in the church calendar, they're in our architecture, right? Um, but they all have a purpose, to point us back to God and our salvation. Okay? So that's what we want to remember about the Israelites remembering what they were supposed to remember with the stones. Are we still on the horse? Or did we get washed away in the Jordan River? Okay. Well, this is a, a interesting. <coughs> I was reading and they, the archaeologists finally found Jericho. They were beginning to wonder yeah. Oh, okay. They excavated. They actually found two Jerichos. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. And b last week, I think Bob t talked about one archaeologist who found it didn't. Well, anyway, she said stuff contrary to the evidence, which we know isn't weird, oh, right? Uh, yeah. For those of us who have YouTube, like great yeah. biblical mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yep. Yep. All right. Oh, okay. So it can it could end up on my desk in this giant black hole. Okay. Let's pray, shall we? Our Father, indeed it is joyous to learn. Well, how you want us to remember things that that though you may do something new in a sense it is nothing but what you have always 
done from of old, which is to watch over your people and save them. Bless us all our days with this gift of memory so that as we go through the church or calendar, as, the, as when we look at the cross, when we hear our altar gift, tell us of all the different things related to the Christmas symbols. May they all point us to Christ so that we may marvel at our salvation and who you are. In our Savior's name we pray. Amen.